The second scripture reading for today is from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 16, verses 13 through 17. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I love our cover screen. Thank you, Mike, for creating that, and Barry. Um, finding faith at the movies, and we get to have another movie. And we've discovered a lot of things about copyright laws in uh, working on all these movies, um, and discovered things that we can say and things that we can't say. And there's more that we can't say than we can say. So the title may seem a little cryptic, but hopefully it'll lead you to uh, where this movie is, and you'll understand when you see the, the clip at all. But Puzzles, Leaps, and Grails, The Journey of Faith. Uh, so let's begin with a word of prayer, and then we'll dive in. Ah, gracious God, we give you thanks for this morning. We give you thanks for the opportunity to come and to hear your word. And Lord, as I take the time this morning to share the message, I ask that uh, either because of me or in spite of me, that you bring a message to your people. I ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. So this morning I want to talk about intentional discipleship. Um, not as a brand new thing, not as a new model, but as something that has been a calling on our lives and who we are as a people uh, under Christ from the very beginning. That it's not just a job of the, the pastor or specific leaders in the church, but it's something that each of us are called to. And uh, hopefully you'll understand this even more as we go through the, the message today. But I want you to just have that as a thought in your mind as you hear everything and discover where you are in that process and where, you may, where God may be calling you to be uh, more and more. But I wanted to take a look at the scripture passages for today and make sure that we don't overlook them. Sometimes, I don't know about you, but I feel like some Sunday mornings, you got a lot going on in your mind, and the words just go through, and it's like, oh yeah, I've heard that before, that's nice. This morning, I want you to really hear the words. I want you to hear what it's saying. I want you to hear the intentionality behind what is being shared. Deuteronomy is a law book in the Hebrew Bible. It's, it was rules, it was laws, it was things being offered to a community saying, you must do these things. These are important things. So therefore, we need to be able to take time to really think through. So in the Deuteronomy passage, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. That's called the Shema. Okay, that is an intentional, important prayer. Am I pronouncing that correctly, Shema, or am I getting it totally wrong? Help me out. Is that right, Shema? Excellent. I thought I had it, but I wasn't sure. I just wanted to check. Uh, but that is an intentional, important prayer. That is basically saying God is sharing this with you. God is offering this to you. This is an important thing you must listen to. This is morning prayer. This is evening prayer. Uh, for the Hebrew people, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. Ever heard that before? Yeah, Jesus said that, right? That was one of the things Jesus said too. Where do you think he got it from? Deuteronomy chapter 6, that's where it came from. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. So what space is there not to talk about them? Is there any? No. So you could change that. When you're at the grocery store, when you're at the restaurant, when you're at work, when you're driving on the road. Hmm. There's lots of things I think to say sometimes, and I need to remember this is what I should be saying when someone cuts me off or 
driving in the rain yesterday, oh my gosh. Um, so impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home, when you walk along the road, when you lie down, and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands. Bind them on your forehead. Write them on the door frames of your house. Do you get the intentionality that they're coming at this with? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. What if we had that intentionality about how we shared the love of God with other people? What if we were popping it on our forehead? What if we did have it on the door frames of our house so it's something that we remember when we walk in and when we walk out? What if it was the first thing that we talked to our family about in the morning and the last thing we talked to our family about in the evening? What if it was something that we were intentional about sharing when we're out and about, whether it be Sam's Club, the grocery store, a restaurant, out at one of the rec games that's going on, or just out and about? What would the world look like if we were sharing good news to everyone? And sometimes I think it comes back to the question that Matthew offers to his disciples in our passage from today. It says, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? What if we asked that question today? What if we talked to everybody here, sitting in the congregation today, who do you say that Jesus Christ is? Would we all have the same answer? Would the answer be true for each and every one of us? Would we be saying that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, our Lord, and our Savior? Or would we be confused about who this is, where the other disciples were saying, some say you're John the Baptist, some say you're Elijah, and others say Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. Maybe, Jesus, you know, you were kind of a good guy. You shared some good teachings, and that was kind of cool, but then you died. And we laugh. But how many people that claim... Christianity is their faith have that question about who Jesus is. And if we have that question or doubt about who Jesus is, then then the question becomes, is there good news to share with everyone? If we truly claim Jesus Christ as our Lord and our Savior, someone that came into our lives and changed everything, someone that came into our lives and made everything new for us, Someone who came into our lives and took us from where we were and brought us to a new place. If we claim that as good news about who Jesus Christ is, then we have good news to share. Then we want to put it on our door frames. Then we want to pop it on our foreheads. Then we want to share it when we're rising and when we're lying down, when we're out and when we're coming in. We want to share it with everyone that we possibly can, but it comes down to the question for each and every one of us, who do you say that Jesus is? We have to take time to wrestle with that. We have to take time to determine that. Sometimes you have to go, go back through your life. You know, Pam and I had this uh, conversation a while ago when I received my call. I wasn't so much a Christian. I was trying to figure out who I was. I was trying to climb out of the mess that I had been in as a kid and everything else. And I had a once and done moment with God that took me from where I was and put me in a new direction, which is why I'm here. This is nowhere near where I ever expected to be. Growing up as a kid, nothing. I never expected to be in front of a church sharing anything, nor would I have ever thought that I'd be worthy to do so because of things that I did. But I had a moment where I experienced the amazing love and grace of God that launched me in a new direction that put me here today. For some, though, like Pam, she grew up in the church. She's known God her entire life. It's been a process. It wasn't a one-time experience, but it was a, it was a process for her of, of coming to know God. For each of you, it may be that way. Maybe you've had that 
one-time experience, but for some of you, maybe it's been growing up in the church and it's been a process that's been building over time where you've come to know God. But here's what I'm saying. Come to know your story. Where has God intersected with your life story? Where has God encountered you? Where have you encountered God? And how has that changed who you are? Because when you come to know those stories, when you come to know those messages, okay, that's when you can answer, you are Jesus, the Son of God, our Savior. When you can say that and claim that, then you have good news to share. Not only good news to share, but good news that you want to share. So that brings us to our movie clip for this morning. And I I want to be able to share share this with you and then talk a little bit more about it. Um, And uh, yeah, I'll come back to this other stuff later. I'm off script now. Um, But this is a movie clip that I love to show for confirmation class uh, each year. And, you know, they laugh at me or whatever, but I still think it is the quintessential confirmation movie. Um, So just to set up the scene a little bit, um, our main character uh, is someone who uh, follows puzzles and solves them and leaps and grails, and you'll understand in a minute. Uh, But his father has been mortally wounded. His only chance of saving his father is to try to come to grips with what it is that he believes. In fact, that's the question that's been asked of him. What is it that you believe? And he's got to go through a series uh, of things to try and figure that out. Now, to help him, his father has made it his lifelong quest to journal everything it is that he believes, everything it is that's important to him, to give to his son as a guide to help him. And in this moment, the son, who has been on the outs with his dad a little bit, has to listen to the words of his father, has to listen to the message that's been given to him, and make decisions based on that. So let's watch the clip, and then we'll talk about it a little bit more. Thanks.
See what I mean? That is the confirmation movie, is it not? It's the faith that is passed along, but then it comes to the point that it's the decision of each youth, each person going through confirmation to come to a point that they have to decide what is it that they believe. Does that make sense? So it's kind of a fun movie to present that kind of example, that kind of understanding, but the, the message for each of us is to figure out what are we passing along? What are we writing in our journal? What are we saying is so important to us, so much a part of what we believe, so much a part of what our faith is that we're putting it down so that we can pass it along, whether it's a physical journal or whether it's the conversations and the prayers and the life that we're setting up as an example for our next generations to come up in faith and know what it is to believe and to love and to serve Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. While at annual conference, they reiterated that our mission as a United Methodist Church is to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. And that comes from the Great Commission in which Jesus says, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the end of the age. So in other words, Jesus offers to go with us. But the commission is for each and every one of us to go into all the world and to share the good news of Jesus Christ, to baptize, to make disciples for Jesus that are going to continue to follow in that path. And then I took an extended workshop with uh, Reverend Vance Ross, who's a pastor from our conference, but works now with the general board. And he teaches and guides churches and pastors from around our denomination. And he talked about the need for intentional discipleship, not for church growth and not for church finances, but because it's our calling, our mandate, our commission, and our great joy to do so. And we talked about the fact that far too often, not just Epworth, many, many churches over the many years have gotten to the point where they think that the only disciple makers are the church staff or specific people who have stepped up to leadership in the church. If you have claimed Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you are a disciple of Christ. If you are a disciple of Christ, That means you are also a disciple maker. What are you writing on your door frames? What are you posting on your forehead? What are you attaching to your hands? What are you lifting up when you rise and when you go to sleep? What are you sharing around the dinner table? What are you sharing when you're out and about? What are you writing in your journal to pass along? Our society, our church, has fallen away from the concept that our life is not about us. It's about who we serve. Jesus' life was not about him. He came to serve and to set that as an example. Our life, our faith, our job, our mission is to pass on the good news, to pass on the faith, to encourage one another's in it so that young people stand up and say, I feel a call from God and I want to see where that's going to take me. Where they begin to go forth in faith and share their faith with others and make a difference in their lives. That's what each and every one of us is about. And I've heard people say, that's for younger people to do. I'm done with all that stuff. I'm older. I taught Sunday school back in the day. Whatever. No. All it means to make a disciple is to love somebody, and I don't think there's anybody at any age that doesn't have the ability to love someone. Beloved, we've got confirmation going to be starting up in the fall, and in fact, Pastor Kate is talking about doing a whole church confirmation uh, process, allowing anyone that would like to, to remember their confirmation again. Here's what I'd encourage you. I always seek mentors for the confirmands. But beyond the mentors, I'm also looking for people to love on other people. Love on them. Send them a card. See them on a Sunday morning and say, I'm really glad that you're here and it matters to me that you're here. That's loving on someone and making a difference in their lives. Every single one of us can do that. Does that make sense? Is there anyone not capable of loving someone? I don't think so. 
That's what it means to make a disciple, to walk alongside of them, to love them, to encourage them, and let them know that they matter and that God loves them. So, beloved, our discipleship commitment for this week, I want you to take time to consider your faith story and with whom you are sharing it. And I want you to think of ways that you can take your faith story and share it with others. And parents and grandparents, just one quick reminder before I completely close. No matter how much we've advanced in youth ministry, the one fact still remains. The number one influence in every youth's life is still and remains and will continue to be their parents and their family. It doesn't matter how much faith I share with them. It doesn't matter how much I tell them about Jesus Christ and how much I tell them Jesus loves them unless they're getting that from you and their family. They're not going to hear it as well. So remember, you are a vital and important piece in the faith development of your kid's life. And we need to be partnering together to share that with them. Amen? Amen. Thank you.